What's the likelihood that uh, an executable gets loaded at the place it's requesting in memory? Uh, the likelihood that an executable gets loaded at the place it requests in memory depends on whether ALSR is turned on overall. Did I say it right today? ALSR, ASLR. ASLR is turned on for the operating system overall. So uh, if it's turned on overall, then, um, then it depends on whether the flags are set for this particular binary saying I support ALSR, ASLR. And if those flags are set, so where are those flags going back to the, uh, right? So here's MS Paint, right? And we need to go find those flags. Back in the optional header, there's the dynamic base flag. And that says, dear OS, you can go ahead and move me around if you want. If you're, if you're currently using ASLR, you can go ahead and move me around. Right? And so then the likelihood is basically 100%. Or, you know, it's not 100%. There's, you know, a certain number of slots that the OS can put it into, depending <coughs> on whether it's 64-bit or 32-bit. And the probability that it doesn't get the slot is minus 1 over however many slots there are, something like that. Yes? So how do modern exploits wait, uh, break past ASLR? Do they find I think the exploits class, no. Do they how find they ways to change the, that, um, that setting there? And no, so they don't actually end up changing this. It's more the most common way, and what you'll see in the exploits 2 class as the, the easy way around it, is you just find somebody who didn't set this flag, like the Flash plugin. And then they are saying to the OS, please don't move me around. I'm going to break if you move me around. And because of that, they get the base address that they asked for. And then with high probability, especially if it's an EXE, it gets the base address it wants. If it's a DLL, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But in the Flash plugins case, as you see in the Exploits 2 class, uh, it gets the base address it wants. And then they just know where some code is. And then they'll use snippets of the code and chain them together. It's called return-oriented programming. You just take little snippets of the code and you, you make it so that you execute some sequence of these snippets. So the other way is that, um, the other way is even if a thing is randomized, if you have an exploit that doesn't just give you arbitrary write permission, but gives you arbitrary read permission, if you can read some values from memory, you can basically figure out where stuff ended up getting put. So you can figure out, you know, it's randomized, and it's randomized basically per run. So you load up the executable, stuff is randomized, it's put in a particular place, and then, you know, that it stays there forever until the thing's terminated and restarted, for instance. And so if you can read memory, and let's say you have arbitrary read and you can, you know, keep reading without crashing anything, you know, you can read at offset, you know, <clears throat> for instance, you would you could do... You know, you'd say, you'd be basically trying to profile, like, where are these different DLLs loaded in memory? So you'd maybe read at E8000, then E9000, and then E A000. And you could literally, like, bounce around trying to find the particular DLL that you're looking for in memory by, like, just trying all the possible addresses. Or <coughs> if you know some relative address relative to some function, you just, if you can find the address of a function, then you can look it up that way. So. You break it typically either by exploiting things that are not ASLR or by having an arbitrary read which leaks memory, leaks information about where stuff is in memory, and then once you've got the information, then you code it according to that information. Just try to match up to find what you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he had one first, yeah. With ASLR, does that move around the entire module? Yeah. It doesn't mix things around little section it's by section. Module yeah. granularity. Yep. So okay. some some so once you once you get one hook, then you everything else resolves. Yep, exactly. And actually the interesting thing is that I, I didn't think this was the case. And so I don't know, let's confirm whether it's true or not. I thought that on Windows 7 by default, even it didn't map stuff into the same virtual memory address across things. So I said before that you know the OS tries to, you know, optimize the use of physical memory by saying, I'm going to copy, you know, kernel32.dll into physical memory once, and then anybody who wants to use it, I'll point their virtual memory at that physical memory. I thought that it would potentially use different virtual memory addresses for that same physical memory address. Like, so this guy would get it at E8000, and it would say kernel32, and that guy would get E9000 for kernel32. 
But I was looking in Process Explorer the other day, based on someone asserting that what I was thinking was not the case. Actually, I probably have to run this as administrator. <clears throat> and so in Process Explorer, you can see the DLLs. Let's see, do I have to choose the columns? Select columns. I want the base address where the thing is loaded in memory. So here's now the addresses where stuff is actually loaded in memory. And so I was thinking that, for instance, like active EDS.dll in this guy's process would be at a different location than active EDS and a different guy's process. And so these are two separate processes. They're the same process, but they're different isolated memory spaces. So 7FEFA7B. And this guy doesn't have active EDS. <laughs> All right, advanced API 32. PP 48. Advanced API 32, anybody? No? Advanced API 32? Well, that's 32 bits, so that doesn't count. There we go. Yeah. So advanced API 32 is at 7 PP 48. In that process, and advanced API 32 is at 7 PP48 in this process. So this is part of why, like, if you have an arbitrary read in, you know, one program, it can even be different programs. If you can inspect the memory addresses range for one process with a read, you, even if you're exploiting something else, because they're randomized, they're randomized at load time, but then it's reusing this virtual address across different processes as well. You can make assumptions that, you know, if you're looking for this DLL in that process over there, that it's going to be at the same base address. So. But yes, yeah, so some of the more advanced researchy kind of things, like there's an IARPA project that's trying to take a bunch of academic work, and they do sort of more fine-grained randomization, where they will like take individual functions and randomize the order of those things, and take the variables on the stack and randomize things like that. So there's a lot of academic work in that, trying to do more fine-grained ASLR. ASLR. But um, you incur performance overhead, obviously. So it's one thing to just like move the blob here versus there. It's another to start, you know, randomizing at runtime to start, you know, slicing up little pieces and putting them all over the place. So it's really Microsoft is basically the reason why we have this, for instance, even just that it's reusing this virtual address across different things. I believe it's because of uh, the performance implications of using different virtual addresses means different processes would have different cache misses and stuff like that. So Microsoft's doing the balancing act between performance and security here. And you know, I think Windows 8 definitely has more randomization. So I do think that in Windows 8 they're actually doing inter-process randomization of the base addresses. But don't quote me on that. Until I get it in my hand. I just think I read that somewhere. So. All right. So, anyways, that was delay